Hi, and welcome to a special edition of Four Wheels Good, your weekly topical motoring programme. It's special for two reasons. We have the first of our reports from Europe's premier motor show in Switzerland. Also, is the car you drive an award winner? This year's What Car Awards have been announced, and we'll have not only the winners, but details of the runners up and why each car deserved the award. Let's start the program this week with our first reports from the home of the famous water jet, Precision Jewellery and Switzerland's annual motor show. Here's Ginny and Mike in Geneva. You may well associate it with cuckoo clocks, Toblerone and incredibly healthy bank accounts, but Geneva in Switzerland is also the home of the big one. What do we mean by big one, Mike? I don't know what you mean by big one, love, but uh, let, yes, we are at Geneva for probably the most significant show of the year. Switzerland, of course, is a, a neutral car country in the true sense of the word. It doesn't have a car producing facility of its own. So all the world's manufacturers congregate here every March. It's the springtime, it's the first show in 1997, and it's probably the most important show of the year. Yep, it's the 67th 1997 International Geneva Show with over a thousand makes and models on display here. And you can guarantee that Mike and I will be bringing you all the news, so make sure you keep watching. Just Dansfield, I met Roger from What Car. Hello. Hello Roger, how are you doing? Are you alright? Yeah, I think so, thanks. Okay. Behind us the Mercedes A-Class, what do you think of it? I think it's very good. It looks um, it looks right. We've all seen sketches over the years um, gradually leading up towards this, but when they actually took the covers off it last night, I think everybody was impressed. Yeah, it's not really the traditional Mercedes image though, is it? There's all these drivers that like their big flash Mercedes. What do you think they're going to make of it? Uh, Mercedes are, are working very hard to try and make sure that they think it's good. Um, but mes the traditional Mercedes image is actually changing. If you look at the SLK Roadster, the V-Class People Carrier, now this, some of the estates they're doing, uh, and other coupes they're doing, Mercedes is no longer just big traditional family saloons. But y you're right, they do have one um, PR job to do on this. They've got to reassure people who spend £100,000 on an S-Class that they're not watering down the Mercedes image by building this, which is going to be on sale for about £13,000. They could have done something really funky with it, couldn't they? And it is nice and it's different from Mercedes, but do you think it stands out enough? Because I don't know if I'm convinced. It might not stand out enough here in a motor show with all the glitz and the glamour, but I think when you see one on the road it'll stand out, certainly for the first 18 months, two years of its life anyway. So when can we see them on the road? Well, you will get them in Europe probably around about autumn this year. The exact timetable for UK hasn't been finalised yet, but I think we're looking at spring 98. So what about behind the wheel? Do you think it's going to be the true Mercedes driving experience? Well, they're talking about fun. They still say it will be safe, it will have the quality, the comfort image. They, they went to very great pains to stress that last night. But because it's aimed at a younger audience, they're talking about fun. Um, and if, if, they do any, if they've done anything similar to what Ford have done with car, I think we can look forward to driving it. This is the highlight of the show, without doubt. This is a very, very important car, both in terms of the motor industry itself and certainly for Mercedes-Benz. Oh, 
As we heard from Roger Stansfield, this is a very exciting story for Mercedes, and I'm joined by Doug Wallace from Mercedes UK. The idea of um, a small car in Mercedes, it just doesn't sort of quite seem to gel together. Why was this decision made? Well, the market for the small car is a market that we should be in. We're growing in volume all the time. So although this is a small car, in every way, in every inch, it's a Mercedes. Small car, definitely. What about small car pricing? What will this retail at, Doug? Well, we still haven't got final prices yet, but I think you'll find that the car, in fact, in the UK will be very, very competitive. How do you think that your, the drivers of your top-of-the-range luxury Mercedes are going to feel when they see these all over the roads? Are you taking away a little bit of the exclusivity that comes with having a Mercedes badge, do you think? No, I don't think so, because we're always a premium car. We're a quality car manufacturer. Many people, for instance, who have S-Class cars will probably have this as a second car, or maybe their wife will have it. So, no, that doesn't give us a problem at all. In fact, it's the opposite. We'll get more and more people onto the Mercedes ladder. Yeah, you've got an incredible customer loyalty, haven't yeah, you, as a, have. as a company anyway. Do you feel that this will, will happen, you'll get people buying this as a second car, maybe a car for children? Very much so. We'll get younger people into buying this car, people who perhaps at the moment can't afford to get onto the Mercedes ladder. But yes, this will be their entry level, so it'll be very good. Is there a sense of responsibility in a way with a company like Mercedes that are renowned for producing high quality executive vehicles to make sure that a cheaper car isn't cheaper, that it still has that level of class and is it quite difficult to do? It's been quite difficult on many ways to get this car from the concept to the design stage and then into production but it has all the qualities of every other Mercedes you'll find on the road. It's a very very safe car which was one of the prime objectives and also very very spacious indeed, very flexible car. All of the seats except for the driver's seat for instance can come out so on the one hand you have a small family car and the next if you want to uh, travel with something quite bulky in the car very quickly take the seats out and there you've got uh, luggage space. From the inside of the A-Class, it's incredibly spacious. Is there actually storage space underneath the floor as well? Because I know there's um, space in between, isn't there? That's right. Basically, you've got two floor pans with the car with a space in between. And in between there goes the exhaust pipe, the battery. Later on, if there's an electric version, the actual electric batteries will go between that space. So it makes, it, it makes very much sense because the driver is here, the passengers are here, there's no engine in front, it's underneath. All the rest of the, the gubbins of the car, if you like, are between the two floor pans. I like that word, the gubbins. But does the gubbins being under there mean that it's maybe more expensive to service and to look after? No, actually it's quite the contrary. It's actually easy to get to the top of the engine from the front of the car, and all the rest of the engine you can get access from underneath of the car. The side panels at the front are made of a special plastic and are bolted onto the car, so repair costs on the vehicle are actually quite, quite reasonable. Does that um, increase safety levels as well, with all the mechanics being away from the front of the vehicle? Very much so. This was fundamental in the design of the car. Most small cars have the tendency that in an accident at the front, the engine gets pushed literally back into the driver. So with this car, with an accident, the engine goes underneath and away from the driver. So you, you're, you're much, much safer in this car. There's so much new technology on this vehicle and so much new development that I'm sure is incredibly expensive. How have you managed to do this, yet keep the price down and keep it affordable? Well, of course, Mercedes does invest a lot in development and a lot in safety, so all that has come from that overall budget. And, of course, we've learnt a lot from our other cars as well and have passed that information down onto the A-Class. And how many of these do you hope to see on the roads of Europe, say, in five years' time? Well, in Britain, for instance, we'll probably sell 18 to 20,000 of these, and we think that number will grow quite rapidly. And, in fact, already, without any advertising or anything in the UK, there's a lot of people who have actually approached us and say, hey, I'd like to have this car. You're not going to believe this, but uh, this is my new car. It's the new Volvo V70 all-wheel drive. It was the one that we drove, of course, in Norway a few months ago in pitch darkness. This very car is coming back to England, and I'm going to be running it, and these two guys are responsible for this car. Jose, you're the interior designer. Yeah, that's right, Mike. Uh, obviously, I've, I've driven the car. And I sort of know what to expect, but uh, if I've got any problems, you don't mind if I give you a call and complain about rattles Absolutely or squeaks? Absolutely not. I mean, that's what I want to know. If there is anything wrong, please tell us so we can put it right. I mean, just, very important. just remind people how different it is on the inside to the old way. It's a complete redesign of the interior, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, the ergonomics on the previous car were good, yep. but uh, we went beyond that. We improved them here, we changed that. 
and we have changed all the material surfaces, the architecture, the comfort. All in all, I can say it's a brand new car. And the sound system is pretty good as well. Oh, great. You can select your best music there. That's kind of important to me. Yeah. The, other, the other bloke that uh, is responsible for this car is uh, Peter Horbury, the, the design chief for Volvo in Gothenburg. Peter, of course, is a Brit who had to go to Gothenburg to get a job. Uh, Peter, <laughs> and what a job it is. Um, Peter, you're res responsible for the overall design. Jose, of course, being responsible for the interior. I mean, uh, what can I expect with a car like this? Well, I'm so pleased to see you've actually grown up at last, Mike. You've actually bought a Volvo. This is wonderful news. You're taking some responsibility in life. Excellent. That's right. Uh, the, yeah. boy, the boy racer days are right. No, quite seriously. I mean, I've got two kids. Uh, I want to be surrounded by the safest car in the world. Yeah. And for my money, this has got to be Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You've got it. Yeah. And uh, I think that um, a lot of people have woken up to the fact that uh, safety doesn't mean boring anymore. Yeah. You know, it really can be an excitement, and that's what we've uh, we've introduced here. Now, safe and fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, people might be looking at this car, thinking it's not terribly different to to the one it replaced. I mean, the the the, the interior is hugely different. Yeah. The exterior, it's more subtle, isn't it? Okay. Well, uh, certain things we had to keep. The doors, for example, were uh, were kept. A huge investment in doors, and they take a long time to develop. So we kept the doors, but the whole front end is new. The, the windscreen is further forward, there's a whole lot more shape in the front, you see the strong V shape of the, the hood, just like on the, the S40 and V40, it's Volvo's new sort of calling card, it's a recognisable Volvo, but the grille remains vertical, even if it's brand new, um, that's one of the Volvo signatures as well, is people recognise Volvos for certain things, and so long as we keep people uh, aware that it is a Volvo product, then they believe in the safety and all the other things that Volvo stands for. But now we've got a bit more style to it, there's a lot more shape, a lot more sculpted form. Well, you don't know this, Jose, but I've got your home number of the interior design. I'll be ringing in with any complaints about 11 o'clock on a Sunday night as he's trying to have an early night before going to work the next morning. You have to tell me your channels because I'm still waiting for my car and you already got yours. Well, that's the other thing. We shouldn't, uh, th this is kind of embarrassing. He's the interior designer. I'm the international freeloader. I've got the car. He can't get one. It's not what you know, Jose. Um, and Peter, I've got your home number as yeah. well. And well, so if I have any problems, I can call you about the exterior design. Yeah. If, if you like the car, please call me. If you want to say how nice it is and how good it is, how nice you feel about the car, ring me anytime. If you don't like something, you've got Jose's number. So please, <laughs> you know, he's the one to blame. They think I'm joking. This one's going to run and run, let me tell you. Well, here it is at last, the long-awaited BMW 5 Series Touring, or a state car for you and I. It certainly looks the part, but how does it drive? Well, make sure you keep watching Four Wheels Good because our own Mike Rutherford, the true BMW enthusiast, will be test driving one in just a couple of weeks' time. Mike Rutherford takes delivery of a Volvo, eh? Who'd have believed it? Well, winter is almost completely behind us now, thank goodness, and soon the weather will be perfect to enjoy proper touring. I say touring because BMW have always called their estate cars touring. But for Volkswagen, estate is the name on their most popular variant of the Passat range. The saloon of the all-new Passat will be available in UK showrooms any day now. And to see how the estate version shapes up, join us after the break. Hi and welcome back to Four Wheels Good on Granada's Men and Motors channel. Well, later on in the programme we'll have full details of the best cars of the year. But right now let's return to the Geneva Motor Show where maybe we'll see some new vehicles which will make next year's awards lists. Here's Ginny Buckley. You'll probably recognise the front end of this car, but do you recognise the back end? Because this is the Passat Estate. We've been waiting an awfully long time for it. It seems ages ago that we drove the first right-hand drives up in Newcastle, but here it is at last. Well, we certainly like it a lot, but what do you think? here at last 
it's the long awaited Passata State. What do you think of it? You're the man that's going to be in charge of selling them in huge numbers in Britain. Well, the most important thing is not what I think, but what um, people who see the car think. And uh, we are very, very pleased with the reception the Passat Saloon has had. And if anything, um, the reaction to this one is that people seem to think it's even better looking than the saloon. But surely, as a, a, a PR person, you must sometimes look at cars and think, oh no, we've got to do a great job on this one, or oh, that's a great product, it's easy to sell. Do you think this will be easy to sell for you? I think so, again, just from people's reaction. If people like a car immediately, they see it and they say so, then um, that, that's great. But you can be too close to the business. If you're responsible for selling your own products, then perhaps your own views aren't as valid as those of your potential customers. Just going back to the Passat Estate, it seems an awful long time since we drove the left-hand drive versions. What have been the problems and also when can we expect to see right-hand drive versions on the road? Well, the lead times haven't been quite as short as, as they normally are. I mean, we presented the left-hand drive ones back in October and we said we look, we'd be launching right-hand drive in the new year. And in fact, um, build started in January and we're now building up stock for a launch in a couple of weeks' time. Surely, that looking back at the old Passat, the estate actually made up the bulk of the sales, didn't it? So why was the decision made to release the saloon before the estate version on the new Passat? Well, we're, we're very happy. If we take the UK situation, I think we sold about 60 or 70 percent estates to saloons, but uh, we never really penetrated the business market with, with the Passat. But the new one will be a high volume seller. We're going to be selling about 40,000 units a year and uh, we'll be selling about 70% uh, saloons and 30% estates, so the balance will shift the other way. I know when we spoke, I think it was back in, in Birmingham at the NEC, when, when the Passat Estate was first launched, you talked about these high volumes that you were aiming for. Is everything on target for that now? Everything's on target, except that uh, to begin with, um, obviously uh, demand is going to exceed our ability to supply. So as we saw with the Polo, where we went into the market with a class seeding product um, for about nine months, we weren't able properly to supply the car. But Polo's our best seller, so after about a year, um, the Passat's going to be a very important car for us. Now, the one thing that everybody really wants to see, well, there are two things, of course. There's the, there's the new Golf and there's also Concept One, the Beetle. Mm. When can we expect, expect to actually be able to see them? Uh, new Golf will probably see um, its international launch at the Frankfurt Show, which is September. But um, the, the, the current Golf, in fact, is selling better than it's ever sold in the UK. We had a record year, so, so we don't really need a new one um, just yet. And the new Beetle probably at the Detroit Show next January. There's an awful lot of talk about investment in Britain and one of the companies that's often forgotten about when we're talking about spending money and creating jobs in the UK is dear old Honda. And With me is uh, Ken Keir from Honda UK, one of the directors with Honda. Ken, some great news for Britain in particular with this car. Absolutely, this is the third car to go down the line at our manufacturing plant in Swindon. Gives us the opportunity of moving from the current 100,000 production progressively in the next two years up to 150,000. And will you be badging it as the Civic Estate or haven't you decided yet? It will be an estate version of the Civic. We haven't decided on its name yet. Yeah. And I guess pricing, it's far too early to talk about if it's not going into production for another, what, nine, ten months? Absolutely. Production doesn't start till January next year. We'll sell it in spring of 98. Pricing, clearly a lot can happen in the market, but it will be competitive. And you can survive in this world, can you, without your partner's rover? Well, I think we can more than survive without any other partners. Yeah, we're doing we're doing quite well, quite comfortably. Always like to do better, but we're confident. I think it's, sure. al it's also significant that since you've uh, parted company with them, that they're uh, not exactly having the best time of it. But we'll we'll save that for another day. Um, <laughs> the uh, the other question I often wonder about is when we're looking at uh, Japanese cars being built in Britain, if you know what I mean, um, uh, what about quality levels? I mean, people buy Hondas because of that legendary Japanese quality. All right, they look like uh, cars that might have rolled off a production line in Japan, but is the British auto worker as good and as capable as his counterpart uh, in Japan? Unquestionably the case. We don't have any issue whatsoever with regard to quality. The, the best way to describe it is our dealers now assume that the quality of production, whether it be America, Japan or UK, makes no difference. And the customer now expects and we demand that the quality is the same. The guys on the line, the girls on the line, they are almost more critical of quality than maybe anybody else's. We don't have a problem. There. And I think it's fair to say, when you're starting off uh, as Honda does, and they do, do things, uh, you know, 
properly, it means that you've got the infrastructure there, the systems there, so you're using Japanese technology, aren't you? And Japanese work practices and Japanese equipment in, uh, quite often. Yes, there are Japanese work practices, there are Japanese principles of quality, but they're obviously moulded into the Europeanisation. You know, the car sitting behind us will be as European as any other car in Europe in terms of sourcing and uh, manufacturing. Clearly, it's the Honda badge, but it's a European car for the European market. Car manufacturers have a difficult job synchronising projects in order to unveil them at the International Motor Shows. A lot of us had hoped to see Saab's new 95 unveiled here at Geneva, but sadly that wasn't to be. The press will get their first glimpses of it at the Trollhattan factory where it's produced in June, and it will be seen in public for the first time at the Frankfurt Show in September. But we managed to get a sneak preview, and we went to Sweden to meet the new MD of Saab, Robert Hendry. And here it is, the first pictures of the new Saab 95, a sedan to be launched this summer to compete in the premium segment head-on with BMW, Mercedes and Audi. Saab has an excellent reputation, but could it ever really compete with the likes of BMW? Well, we think that we offer uh, something that is, you know, unique to Saab. Uh, we, there, there's room in the premium market for several premium brands because that's the nature of the customers. Uh, they're looking for something that, that is more personal to them. And, and we think that Saab represents something that is, uh, you know, unique. Uh, uh, we're known for safety. We're also known for performance. We're known for both. Uh, uh, there is a unique feeling. There's a unique look to the car. So we think that there's room in the premium segment uh, for our premium brand as well as the others. This press conference in Sweden was the first opportunity to hear Robert Hendry since he joined Saab last year. What has been its focus during this period? Well, when the stockholders asked me to come to Saab, their objectives were pretty clear, and that was to increase the value of the brand and make money. So I've been focusing really hard on understanding the business strategy, understanding uh, the new products like the 9.5 and how we were executing them and whether we understood who our customers were and how well we were meeting those customer requirements. So those things have been pressing very hard on my mind to really understand that for the first six months. In recent years, Saab has been struggling to make decent profits. What strategies would he implement to improve the situation? Well, in, when we look at uh, where our customers are, uh, and probably more importantly, where our customers be but aren't today, uh, there's a lot of opportunities in the, in the major premium car markets around the world uh, where we have an opportunity to increase our awareness, uh, to make people aware of the Saab brand, and hopefully through demonstration to get them to drive a Saab and really experience the true uh, feeling of the brand. It's really a, a unique feeling. Uh, the synthesis between performance and safety is great. I personally love driving the car, and I think most people that, that will try it will have that same feeling. And that, in the end, is going to be the, the thing that is going to make Saab a successful company, is meeting those customer requirements and giving that emotional thrill that you get with driving this car. Mm, the new Saab 9.5 looks very interesting. Well, as you've taken the decision to watch our programme, I'm sure you share our enthusiasm for the latest designs and technologies from the world's automotive industries. Next week, we'll have plenty more new cars, new stories and personalities from the annual Geneva Motor Show in Switzerland. But for this special edition, we dedicate the rest of the programme to the winners and runners-up in the UK's most respected car awards. Has your car won a category in the 1997 What Car Awards? Find out after this break. Hi, and welcome back to Four Wheels Good. Now, many awards in this world are often criticised for either being judged by inappropriate people or for being judged at a rushed few days before the ceremony. Well, neither of those accusations can be squared at the annual What Car Awards, since the seasoned motoring journalists on the magazine appraise cars continuously right the way throughout the year. So the winning lists are taken very seriously by the motoring industry. Well, here are the winners and category nominations from Peter Baker. Even the hardest motoring cynic takes notice of this annual award night in London. The magazine don't just test the cars for a few weeks judging period. The staff are constantly driving, appraising and reporting the endless new cars that clog up their car park. So what are this year's winners? In the budget category, the short list contained the Citra AX, nearing the end of its life now but even better value. Frugal, nippy, it's still one of the cheapest cars to run. 
Then there's the Fiat Cinquecento Sporting, the driver's choice. Bags are fun and dynamic flair as well. The third nominee, the Skoda Felicia. This miracle of good value is no stranger to these yearly awards, thanks to its pretty functional design and spacious interior. The winner of this category, for its practicality and hard value, the winner had to be the Skoda Felicia. The Skoda Felicia won for the second year running because it's essentially the only car under £7,000 you could credibly use as a family runabout. And don't let the name put you off either. The Skoda's, Skoda's as well built as the rest of the VW range and is good to drive too. On the downside, it's not exactly brimming with kits and equipment, but you get a long warranty and it's guaranteed to hold its value as well. The Super Mini category had as a nomination last year's winner, the Ford Fiesta. Brilliant to drive and clever inside, with astonishing security for its price. Second, another Ford, and this time the new Ford car. Capturing the spirit of the 90s with its cheeky looks, fun handling and its designer interior. And Volkswagen's grown-up car in a small package, the Polo. Big car feel and refinement, now backed up by a three-year warranty. The winner of this category? Well, for its brave styling and superb road manners, the Super Mini of the year is the new Ford Car 2. Well, the Ford Car represents quite a, a little miracle for, for Ford, especially given that only a few years ago the company really wasn't in the sort of condition to produce something with this kind of imagination and flair. Um, I mean, first of all, it's affordable. It's about £8,000 for the Car 2, which has power steering um, and a lot of the conveniences that you'd expect from much larger cars. Moving along to the small hatch category, and three nominees again here. First, the Fiat Bravo, which won last year with its sweet 1.6-litre engine and sharp handling. The Bravo is a stylish way to travel. Next, the Nissan Almira, which argues its case with its mixture of keen pricing and practicality. The Almira is a hidden talent in a competitive class. And the third nominee is the Renault Megane. Comfortable interior, modern design, a sensible choice for the family. But the winner of this category, for value, looks and handling, the winner was judged to be the Fiat Bravo. The Fiat Bravo, that's an interesting one. We would have actually liked to have given this award to the 1.6 SX last year, but they wouldn't bring the 1.6 engine in. They thought that they could manage with just 1.4s and 1.8s, so we went for the 1.8. Now they've brought the 1.6 in. It's our favourite engine of the three. It's just so sweet, almost almost as quick as a 1.8, um, and it just suits the character of the car so well. It's got this tremendous verve and vitality, um, very Italian in the way it goes, and yet for a three-door car it's immensely practical. Uh, the front seats slide forward when you tilt them, you can get people in and out. It's just as spacious as, um, as, as the five-door Brava, but so much better to drive. It, it really does bring some, some verve and vitality, as I said, to this, to this small hatch class. The family car category. And here's an old favourite, given a dramatic new look recently, the Ford Mondeo. Recent improvements have put this driver's car right back in contention. Second, the sharpest, most responsive car tested, the Nissan Primera. It's beautifully built, refined, and above all, excellent to drive. And the third nominee, the reborn Volkswagen Passat. Forget the old models, this has all the class, quality, and maturity of an executive car. And the winner of this category? Well, the best family car brings a new prestige to the class the new Volkswagen Passat. Well, I think the Passat sort of takes, takes the family car class to another level because it, in some sense it almost feels like an executive car thanks to its build quality and image and cabin space. It's not as much fun to drive as either a Ford Mondeo or a Nissan Primera, i.e. it doesn't handle as well. But what it does is bring added levels of refinement to the class in terms of the way it suppresses engine noise and also in terms of ride refinement. The only problem is you might have to wait a while to get hold of one because there's, all the signs are that the demand is so high in VW dealerships they're set to be a large waiting list for the Passat. The estate category. 
And welcome back the Skoda Felicia. Like the hatch, it's well made and practical and offers amazing value for the class. And then the Peugeot 406 comes next, easily adapting the qualities it has of the saloon to the demands of an estate. The result, a roomy, capable workhorse. And finally in this section, the big Volvo V90, a car which is logical, spacious, solid and durable. The winner of this category, proving that a workhorse can be fun to drive, the estate of the year, is the Peugeot 406 estate. The Peugeot won the estate award simply because it's so well thought through. Too many manufacturers will simply put a box onto the back of the car, their saloon version, and think that's good enough to make an estate. Um, it doesn't really count for much, I'm afraid. What you tend to find is using an estate day in, day out. It's those little practical touches that count for an awful lot, and the Peugeot is, is awash with them. Um, it, it's also very spacious. There's no, no real compromise involved. Um, it will carry a tremendous amount. And, and finally, it drives as well as the saloon. The multi-purpose vehicle category and the first nominee is actually three cars, the Ford Galaxy, the Seat Alhambra and Volkswagen Charan, each offering confident handling, car-like driving position and strong versatility. Second, the futuristic new Renault Espace, which returns to its innovative roots without losing sight of practicality and driving enjoyment. The third nominee in this section is the Vauxhall Sintra. Good on the road, it has an appealing fascia and innovative lightweight seats. And the winner of the MPV category, the MPV which turns a good idea into an even better one. Yes, the Renault Espace. The Renault Espace has won the MPV award because it's just so clever. Um, there are lots of good to drive MPVs now. They're, they're getting more and more car-like. But the Espace has got this ingenuity inside. They've moved things like heating components, the radio, stereo equipment, all around the place. So you've got this huge da central dash area, um, which will actually take a briefcase. They've actually also made it rather good to drive now. They've got rid of the horrible old driving position, stiffened it up at the back with an anti-roll bar, and it doesn't roll around the way it used to do. It's a good all-round car. Now, this year, there's a new category, the Innovation Award which goes to a car which boasts genuinely fresh thinking. It borrows ideas from people carriers, but drives like a smaller car, and all for just £1,000 more than a conventional hatchback. The Innovation Award goes to the Renault Megane Scenic. It's a car that brings genuinely fresh thinking to the world of the small hatchback. It's got a fully flexible interior, just like a bigger MPV, the seats can be taken out, arranged in any order you want. There's plenty of storage space inside. It's got a high roof line, so it's easy to get in and out of. Commanding drive posi driving position, so the driver can easily see the all corners of the car, which makes it easy to park. So for innovation, the award goes to the Renault Megane Scenic. 4 by 4s now, and the first nominee is the Jeep Grand Cherokee, now even better value than ever as the Laredo. Powerful and rugged too, with an unbeatable image. The next 4x4, the Toyota Colorado. A newcomer from a proven manufacturer. Great space, strength and performance. The third car on the shortlist is another intelligent Toyota, the GTI bashing RAV4. It's carved a niche of its own and is selling well. So they're the three on the shortlist, and the winner, the 4x4 of the year, is the Jeep Laredo. The second year running, what cars offer over the year is the Jeep Grand Cherokee. This year, though, it's the Laredo, which is a new version. It's got less equipment, but it's got all the great Jeep Cherokee, Grand Cherokee attributes. It's great off-road, it's great on the road, it looks brilliant. So our best off-roader just had to be the Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo. The compact executive category of the awards now, and the A4, last year's winner, is the first nominee here. An excellent diesel engine is now available, and brilliant ride comfort and quality can be found on all A4s. The Evergreen BMW 3 Series now. Improved engines give new impetus to the UK's favourite small executive car, whose dynamics never cease to amaze. And the Mercedes C-Class, 
and its civilized new diesel engine. The intelligent five-speed auto box adds to the prestige. And the winner of this category, the best compact executive for its pace, style and economy, it's the Audi A4. This time it's the 1.9 TDI 110 bhp version as opposed to the 1.8 petrol car that won for the past two years. Um, what the diesel car adds really is economy and tremendous performance. It is uh, almost as good if not better than the, the petrol car. Um, you've got 40 plus miles per gallon and a tremendous amount of mid-range power and that all combines well with the, the beauty of the A4, the, uh, the suppleness of the ride, the taut handling uh, and the overall appeal that the car has developed, especially since it's been doing so well in the Touring Car Championship. Let's move on to the Executive category. And the first nominee is the BMW 5 Series. This car took the Executive world by storm when it was launched last year, with its great driving manners and ingenious design. The BMW's arch-rival, the Mercedes E-Class, is the next contender, it's a titan of refinement and safety, with strong resale values as well. The third car on the shortlist, the Vauxhall Omega. It continues to be excellent value and offers a forgiving chassis and a smooth ride. But for refinement and handling, the executive car of the year is the BMW 5 Series. This is the second year running that the 5G3 has won our executive car of the year quite simply because it's so easily the best car in its class. It's fantastic to drive, it's got a wonderfully smooth 2.5 litre engine and it's got the build quality and serenity which you associate with an executive car. It looks like it's set to carry on topping its class, well, at least until the new Audi A6 arrives which could present it with some problem. The luxury car category now and the first car here is the BMW 7 Series whose nimble handling belies its size. It's advanced too with plenty of high technology built in. second nominee, the long wheelbase Jaguar XJ6. The extra space makes all the difference to this blend of craftsmanship and agility. And finally the Mercedes E320. Last year's category winner, beating many of its costly arrivals with its quality, fail-safe dynamics and immaculate image. But the winner in this category this year, a superb cruiser made even better with a new engine. Yes, the BMW 735i. It's curious with the BMW 7 Series. Here was a car that didn't win last year, um, but during the past 12 months, BMW have, have added some fairly significant changes to the engine lineup, and that really has given the car the refinement and the pep that uh, luxury car buyers expect. It has all the other things you, uh, that you expect as well. The seats are immensely comfortable. You can drive a thousand miles, climb out and not know it. Um, it is incredibly spacious. The technology in there is, is astonishing. Um, there are all kinds of tricky options you can buy to go with the car. Um, and mostly it's the fact that it's one of those machines you can just get into and know you can forget about the, the cares of the world. A fine looking car and fine to drive too, but then I would say that, wouldn't I, because I drive one. Sadly, a little older than that example. Well, this year's awards have included a new category for designed in security, a very important factor in these days of rising crime. Find out the winner of that and other categories and the overall car of the year after this break. Hi and welcome back to Four Wheels Good and our exclusive television coverage of this year's annual car awards. We've still got quite a few categories to go, including the overall winner of 1997. The next category looks at security. The first nominee is the Ford Fiesta, whose optional deadlocks and clever immobiliser offer a powerful deterrent of theft. Next, the Nissan Primera. Nissan have made significant strides in security recently, and the Primera's lock and immobiliser combination really is terrific. And finally, the excellently secure Range Rover. It certainly frustrated the test team this year and is enough to deter the most committed thief. But the winner of the award, showing that great security need not cost the earth, is the Ford Fiesta. The security award went to the, the Ford Fiesta simply because, well, more or less we hear too many manufacturers complaining that um, good security costs them a lot of money and so they have to pass that on to the customer. I'm afraid the Ford is, is living proof that that just ain't true. 
Um, here's a car that costs under £10,000, and if you fit the optional deadlocks, which I think are about £400, you get a car that will beat the most committed thief. It's got a transponder immobiliser, which sits in the key, so you don't need to arm the immobiliser every time you get in the car. It's a passive system. Um, the locks themselves are incredibly well shielded from attack from the outside. And if you look throughout the car, there are little touches that show this isn't security that's just been bolted on. It's been built in from day one of the car's conception. The Cabriolet Award category now. And the first on the short list is the BMW 318, a cabriolet to keep the enthusiast happy, whatever the weather. And there's even decent room for passengers in the back. Next we turn to the Peugeot 306, beautiful cabriolet that offers exhilarating driving at a reasonable price. And third on the award shortlist for this category, the Volkswagen Golf, beloved of the city slicker. It's built its reputation on durability and solidity, factors that private buyers particularly are attracted by. Well, the winner of this category for showing how a small soft top should look and drive is the Peugeot 306. With so many manufacturers these days producing niche models, we've had to split the, uh, the cabriolet and roadster categories apart from the open top category that we had last year. So what car's best cabriolet of 1997 is the Peugeot 306 cabriolet. It keeps the gorgeous looks of the, the rest of the 306 range, enhances it in fact with the, the soft top that hides behind a flush fitting panel behind the, the rear seats. A little bit of practicality thrown in there as well so you can take uh, people in the back. But what's, what it's really about is the, the driving experience that is so common throughout the 306 range. You've got the two litre engine from the XSI, uh, and the same sort of handling, so it's a really great car to, to throw around, particularly when the sun's out and you can put the hood down as well. On to the best sports hatch of 1997 and the Citroën Saxo VTS is the first nominee. A real throwback to the halcyon GTI days of the 80s, but with late 90s refinement and build quality. The Nissan Almira is next, a ripping 16-valve engine and responsive steering turn a good hatch into an excellent GTI. And finally, the Peugeot 306 GTI 6, a superb six-speed gearbox. It's the driver's car that is a thrill to take on the streets. And the winner of this category for leading the new wave of hot hatches, the best sports hatch is the Peugeot 306 GTI 6. Peugeot 306 GTI 6 is called that because it has a six-speed gearbox, which just enhances um, its performance and what have you. It was up against the Saxo VTS and the Nissan Almira, and they were all terrific cars, great, good handling, little fun boxes. But at the end of the day, it was the 306 that won. Its dynamics were superb. It has a uh, superbly designed interior. It looks terrific, and it just goes like stink. It's lovely. Coupes now, and the first nominee in this category is Fiat's Bold Coupe, last year's category winner, and now with five cylinders under the bonnet. It looks great and is as good to drive as well. Second contender here, the Honda Prelude VTI, whose advanced engine and glorious steering has now been joined by a practical interior. The third nominee, the Jaguar XK8. It combines sports car ability with an evocative shape, a true GT. And the winner of this category for offering performance and flair for the price. The best coupe of the year, once again, the Fiat Coupe. Another winner for the second year is the Fiat Coupe. This year, though, we've given it to the five cylinder turbo version which is extremely fast, genuine 150 mile an hour sports coupe. It's also got those great Fiat Coupe looks that just really throw it to the front of the class, beating all comers very easily. So our coupe of the year is the Fiat Coupe Turbo 20 valve. And now the Roadster category. First nominee is the Lotus Elise, a modern incarnation of one of the all time great roadsters. No one can touch its tactile steering or superb chassis. Next, the all-new Porsche Boxster, another evocative reminder of the essence of sports car motoring. Its shapely curves are complemented by exhilarating driving. 
And finally in this category, the Rover MGF, last year's winner. This car isn't just fun to drive, but well-designed and practical enough to be used every day. And the winner of the Roadster category. Well, for establishing a new category for sports car handling. The best Roadster of the year, the Lotus Elise. The Lotus Elise won the best Roadster class. It was up against the Rover MGF and the Porsche Boxster. When we were judging this class, we were looking for a car that had terrific handling, true sort of reminiscence of the old sports car days and just gave a huge amount of fun. And at the end of the day, it was the Lotus Elise in a true pure form that uh, it's got no real inside to it, it's got no carpets, no radio, anything like that. But at the end of the day, it was the car that just delivered the best and uh, was the best driver's car. But which car out of all these category winners would claim the overall crown? In front of a crowd of thousands, the car of the year was revealed as the Renault Megane Scenic. Designed by a team headed up by our old friend Patrick Lequemont. But why did it win overall? Once again, the editor of What Car, Mark Payton. I think the, the Scenic is really quite a revolutionary car. Um, I suspect that just about every manufacturer in Europe will be producing a version of uh, this sooner or later. Uh, the best phrase I heard to describe it was a double-decker hatch, which I think is quite sweet. Um, it's literally uh, the same size as a Ford Escort or a Vauxhall Astra, so it's easy to park, um, but it's got an incredible amount of headroom because it stands a lot taller. And also you sit higher so you get a better view of the road. The rear seats can be removed or folded or anything else you want to do with them, um, which you tend to find counts an awful lot if you're a young growing family and you've got a lot to carry around with you, you can take the seats out or you want you know, the practicality of sliding one of the seats forward even, so it's easy to reach one of the kids on the back seat. Yeah, it's interesting that the Megane Scenic, which is essentially a mini MPV, has won Car of the Year. This looks like being a whole new class of vehicle. Indeed, next week you'll discover how Rover may be making an MPV version of the new Mini and how Ford may be doing the same on an Escort chassis, which we're reliably told by a top Ford official may well be made at the stricken Halewood plant in Liverpool. Find out more on next week's edition of Four Wheels Good. For more of us on the programme this week, goodbye. We'll see you very soon.